All right. So yes, let's go and begin. So hi, everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your day of your busy schedules to be with us. We're going to be discussing a collaborative project between the Center for Open Science and Internet Archive that automatically preserves pre-registered study designs and outcomes in a format that's easy for institutions and libraries to pull, collect, and share. But before we get to that, we wanna do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we will have a Q&A section at the end of this presentation. Uh, you're welcome to type out any questions that you may have in the QA box, i.e. the chat um, down below and Zoom, and we'll be happy to answer them at the end. You can also raise your hand during the Q&A time uh, as well with the little raise hand feature that's also at the bottom of Zoom. Just if you do it one of those formats, we will be able to see it and we will answer the questions at the end. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, if it will let me get started. Looks like technology is lagging. Would you mind go ahead and clicking on that slide for me, Peggy? Of course. Thank you. All right. So to go ahead and begin, um, we will be sharing about a project and a work, but we also want to first learn from you. So we do have an initial question for this group. And that question is, what disciplines do, um, does, your, does, uh, does your institution support? So we're gonna get everyone to answer that question real quick, and then we will continue. And if you do not support a discipline, then what kind of research do you conduct or what kind of research are you interested in? All right, we're gonna give it another 10 seconds. All right, I'm gonna end poll. All right, fantastic. So it seems that 20% uh, supports arts and humanities, 40% of us support engineering, 20% information and library sciences, and 20% social and behavioral sciences, which is great. We have generalization across most of the disciplines, which I find exciting. All right, so with that, we're gonna go on to the next one. If I can connect to the next slide. I'm sorry, Peggy, you're gonna have to be I, I, I will. I'll do it for you, no worries. Thank you. Uh, so first we're gonna go with introductions and the first one we're gonna be talking about is the Center for Open Science. So founded in 2013, the Center for Open Science or what we call COS or COS is a nonprofit technology and advocacy organization with a mission to increase the openness, integrity and the reproducibility of research. COS requires evidence to encourage change, provide incentives and training to embrace that change and create infrastructure to enable those changes. So to that end, COS has developed and maintains the Open Science Framework or what we call OSF, which is a suite of cloud-based applications which enables and supports rigorous reproducible science by providing collaboration, registration, and data management support across the entire research lifecycle from where you initiate that question of what if all the way to the end and presenting that saying, here's my paper with my answer. So with that, I want to introduce some of our key team members who are gonna be speaking today. First one being me. Hi, I'm Mark. Uh, I am what you call a product owner for Center for Open Science. So what I do is I listen to all the stakeholders, users, and our engineering team to figure out what are the needs and goals and challenges and what do we need to develop to accomplish those, while also adhering to open science best practices. So if you ever have a question, if you ever have a thought or an, an idea, shoot me an email and let's chat. And with that, I'm going to pitch it over to John so he can introduce himself. Hi, I'm John Walls. I am a software engineer at Cause, uh, working on the backend team. Uh, we own the data models and APIs for the OSF, and our team was the one that was heavily involved with building out our side of this integration. So we're really excited to share it with you. All right, and to go ahead and wrap this up, I'm curious. Do you have an OSF account? So we're gonna initiate a poll to get you to answer that question. And like before, we'll give you about 20 seconds to be able to respond. All 
All right. It looks like most of us does have an OSF account, which is fantastic. About 83% of us does, and 17% um, does not. So I'll be interested to hear about what you think about OSF and how it may best fit your goals and needs. All right. With that, I'm going to switch it over to Peggy. Great. Thanks so much, Mark. Uh, oh, sorry. Now I have not, don't have control over my <laughs> screen. Let me see if I can get it back. All right, it's working. Um, so I'm Peggy. I work in the web archiving and data services team at the Internet Archive as a product manager. And I'd like to share a little bit more about Internet Archive and who we are. Internet Archive is a nonprofit digital library that was founded in 1996 with the motto, universal access to all knowledge. Our founder, Brewster Kale, set out to build the Library of Alexandria on the web, and we preserve and provide public access to all kinds of digital materials, including websites, apps, games, music, images, and books. And this year, we topped over 70 petabytes of data. Uh, we are perhaps best known for the Wayback Machine. It's the largest publicly available web archive in existence with over 550,000 users per day. We're also responsible for Archivit with more than 900 partnering institutions archiving web-based content around the world. And more closely related to our topic today, we also work with researchers, policymakers, and academic institutions to harness web archival data for digital humanities research. And with that, I'd love to also share that uh, my colleague, Brian Newbold, is joining us today as well, and I'll let him introduce himself. Hi, I'm Brian. Um, I'm a software developer here at the Internet Archive. I work on uh, preserving, crawling, and cataloging uh, scholarly materials on the web of various uh, media types and content types. Um, and I also work supporting researchers working primarily with our large uh, web archive collection. So doing extractions or helping uh, create subsets of content for various researchers. Great, thanks so much. So we also wanted to give some context into the history of this project and the larger goals. Um, here at Internet Archive, we're proud to work with Center for Open Science on this project. And it's a collaborative two-year national leadership project grant from the Institute of Museums and Library Services in the National Digital Infrastructures and Initiatives category. Uh, both of our organizations are passionate about providing open infrastructure and supportive research. And although researchers rate discoverability of data as one of their main concerns, and many journals require authors publish their data, there's quite a fragmented ecosystem of platforms that's lacking technical integration and coordination with libraries. So since this is such a barrier for research reproducibility and impedes the valuable work of libraries to do, their valuable work ensuring ongoing access to the knowledge produced by their institutions, our goal is to provide long-term access and connection to research data. Right now, that's through registrations and also to harness CASA's expertise in supporting promoting uh, open science practices and enhancing research reproducibility that way. Uh, as of August, I has preserved over 80,000 registrations. This allows critical research data to be archived outside of CASA's open science framework system and ensures perpetual storage and access. And with that, I'm going to hand off to Mark to share more about OSF registrations. Thank you. But to begin that conversation, we have another poll, which is, have you personally or helped submit a registration? And this can be done either on the OSF or through a different organization. So again, we'll give you 20 seconds to be able to respond. All right, it looks like most of us has submitted a registration, but some of us has not. It's pretty much a two to one split, which I think is fascinating. So that is great. And we're gonna actually going to talk about registrations at a really high level first, and then we're gonna dig into the details. So with that, Peggy, if you don't mind going on to the next slide, I would appreciate it. All right, so what are registrations? Registrations are a frozen time-stamped snapshot of a research project and all of the files and content that go with it. 
Pre-registrations are a small subset, which is, it's the same thing, but it's done before the results are known or data is collected and analyzed. The goal of a registration is transparency. When a researcher pre-registers their research, they're simply specifying their research plan in advance of the study and submitting it to a registry or a collection of those registrations. Submitting a research plan increases the credibility of results because essentially what you're saying is, here's the question, here's the data I'm going to collect, and um, here's how I'm going to be able to analyze it, and it's all right then and there. So therefore, if you do make a change, people know about what that change was made and why. It also allows researchers to claim ideas early in that research process. It increases research rigor, and rigor because you have to answer a bunch of questions and think things thoroughly instead of ad hoc throughout the study. So it helps you do a little bit of pre-planning and how you're going to um, anticipate anomalies or potential anomalies. And then lastly, it also minimizes the pressures of things such as p-hacking or harking, which we know as sometimes has been embedded within recent culture. So OSF hosts and maintains what we call OSF registries. We currently have 10 registration templates available that you see on your screen. The first one, OSF pre-registration, is the most thorough and co most commonly used. It has the most questions and it really helps researchers, especially new researchers, think through all the questions that they should consider before conducting a study. The second one, the open init registration, is our most flexible and second commonly used. What it, and what it includes is a description of the study and then you drop in a file. Right now we only have these 10 and we're always expanding the templates that are available but it's really challenging to do that for all the different study designs across all different disciplines. So this allows you to submit a file that, in a way so that way you can still register your study um, and present it in a format that makes sense for that study design for that discipline and for your needs. So if we go into the next slide, which you can see the, the graph that's about to be showed. I love technology, sometimes wow. it takes a second. <laughs> <laughs> a delay. So what this graph illustrates is that since the release of um, OSF registries in 2012, the number of submitted registrations has grown at an increasing rate. And we expect that growth to continue. We do not have the results for 2021, but I can tell you from my preliminary analysis that it's already surpassed 2020, which is what we expect. Um, one thing to note is this does not include what we call community operated registries or core. And I will talk about those here in a quick second. All right, so if we go into the next slide, the American Psychological Association also reported that the number of registered report journals has increased exponentially over the past years as well. So they are, cor well, they are correlated. Um, if you are unfamiliar with these types of journals, they are journals that review and accept an article, a tentative article for a research study before the data is analyzed and results are known. What this does is this minimizes publication biases and other potential negative effects experienced by some peer review or some of the other processes that are in place in our current culture. So this in the previous slide suggests that pre-registration is becoming increasingly normalized within the scientific community, specifically in psychology, and we expect that to generalize to other disciplines. All right, so if we go into the next slide, I'm gonna chat about, yep, community operated registries. So what are they? They are registries led by organizations, disciplines, and different communities. So essentially, they are a specific type of registry, and that community organization sets their own standards and creates rest, a customized registration template that are catered to their specific needs. And then they moderate them for their own specific rigor. Each discipline has its own needs, its own set of standards, and so they need to have registries and communities to moderate them. Um, Core and how we have it in OSF is they're branded, which means they have their own different types of coloration, they have their own images, they have their own icons, and they're all set by the organization that builds them and moderates them. We currently have five community operated registries. And um, when it, whenever a registry is submitted to that core, it is moderated and those that are approved and those that are public, because we do have public and private or embargo registrations, the ones that are approved in public are archived into our internet archive in the pipeline we're about to present. All right, and with that, I will pitch it over to my friend, John. See if I, we'll see if I can get the remote control to work for me or if we'll do some backseat driving here. Uh, 
Yay. Or okay. There was a bit of a delay, but we'll we'll see what we can do. Uh, hey, okay. Everything has gotten synced. Uh, so Mark talked about how we have our community operated registries. We also have the OSF registries, which is anybody can submit a research project that they're working on publicly through this without you know working through some other organization. We don't have any moderation standards, so it's very much you know up to the community and the people working on the project to to own their quality. Uh, but that's kind of the beauty and the point of registrations, right? It's it's there publicly so that folks can come in and say, oh, is your research looking reasonable? Is your plan good? Um, you can see that you can filter by uh, different registries over on this side. Um, and uh, we'll it's going to be fun seeing when this lags and when it doesn't, but we'll make it through. OK, as long as I'm interacting with it regularly, it seems good. Uh, and there is search as well. So, you know, COVID was a major Preprint servers blew up, registrations blew up. Like we need to get information about this out as quickly as we can. We need to make sure that studies are rigorous as we learned very early on with some uh, dubious uh, findings that came out. So you can search by keyword um, and all of these things. And let's take a look at what a registration looks like. Um, so, Really, we are trying to encourage this idea of pre-registration. So front and center, we have these questions for the template that Mark described that lay out what a given study looks like. How are you collecting your data? How are you anonymizing the results? Uh, what are your variables? What is your sampling plan? What is your analysis plan? All of the things that you know happen in this space. And uh, okay. Uh, control back. Uh, over on this right hand side, you can see there is a whole bunch of uh, what we refer to as metadata about the registration. The contributors or authors who worked on it, uh, user provided description of what the research project is. Uh, you can see the template that was filled out, the date that the registration was submitted, uh, some information about tags, license, uh, a DOI identifier, which for every public registration, we also mint a DOI. Um, so metadata all along that right panel. And then on the left-hand side, you can see some information relevant to the OSF projects that the registration is snapshotting. Uh, even if you submit a registration without an OSF project, one is created in the background so that you can continue to use the OSF project to organize your research materials. Um, and let's click through on the files link here. So files are a big part of this whole archiving piece. Um, the OSF supports uh, file storage through providers outside of our ecosystem. You can attach your Google Drive, your Dropbox, uh, various other sources. But when you register a project with information in those sources, we download all of it. We put it in OSF storage so that we know that it is static and immutable. You can see what the data looks like at the time that the project was registered. Um, OSF projects are hierarchical. You can uh, nest them to organize your data in a way that makes sense to you to kind of give different people different levels of access to it, depending on how large the scope of the project is. So if you look at this files page, you will see files from all of the child projects as well. Um, so from the top level view of the registration, you can see everything for all of the components, which is really handy. You can also go and look at what the components of the project are and how it was organized if you want to get additional information. Will that back button work? Looks like I can't click it. Oh, OK.
So yes, yeah, so if you want to see more about the structure of the, the project hierarchy that was registered, you can look at the components and see all of them. And then you can click through, they will share the same responses. There is one set of responses for the pre-registration template for the entire uh, registered project. And, uh, but you can see information that's specific. You can, so every project supports this idea of like a wiki and other places where collaboration can occur. And this whole, the whole value of this thing is that everything, all of the collaboration, all the notes are archived and timestamped if you are registering from an existing project. We also just added the ability to update responses. If you come through and you know, you haven't started your analysis yet and you decide you're changing your plans, so this is a brand new workflow. Um, I am not part of this project, so I can't do it. Uh, but you would be able to come through here and begin a process of updating. That update would need all the same approvals that the original registration did. All of the uh, admin contributors on the project would need to go through and say, yes, that is a valid change to this thing. If it's submitted to a core, the moderators on the core would need to come through and approve it as well. And we are probably at about time, but as I, we said uh, last year, one of our big efforts was creating this workflow where you do not need a project to create a registration. You can just add new. No, I'm not working from the project and you can just get going from there. And with that, it's probably time to kick it back to Peggy. Let her have control of her own computer again. All right, I will see if I can get back in control. I will stop explicitly and maybe that will help you. That helped. Thank you so much. Let me move on to the next slide. Oh, we're in another view. Okay, here we are. So OSF registrations in IA. So I'm going to look at the same registration that John um, pinpointed, but this is gonna be on the archive side. So let's see if everybody can see this all right. So. Here it is in archive.org. You'll see the title. You'll see um, the authors. If you, let's say, if you clicked on the first author, you would be able to, well, let's let it load a little bit, but you'll be able to see all the different registrations or other items that are associated with this author. Let's go back. You'll see the publication date. Uh, the publication date, as well as the description, which is actually taken from the body of the OSF registration. And then one thing I want to note is you can see children. So what these are the other elements that they have registered that's um, affiliated with this work. So if we were to click on one just for you all to look at it and letting it load. Oh, loaded. Okay, so there, there's a survey here that was affiliated with this. It has its own individual um, page. And then other, other elements to note too are there's the DOI from OSF here, as well as um, other categories that, that are specific to OSF that map to how they were categorized in that system, such as OSF registration schema, OSF subjects, and OSF tags. On the right, you have two options for downloading. And then further down, you'll also see the registrations affiliated collections. It's in three collections. And I think this is a good chance, a good time for us to go through here to view how the collection page looks. I'm gonna to go to OSF registrations. All right, so you see the collection description on top. Oh, and it actually took me, took us directly to, as you see, there's like an about and a collection. So if you go into the about tab, there's the larger description, um, some more what we call collection level uh, metadata. And you'll see some stats on the right-hand side, which may be of interest to you. Um, shout out to Brian Newbold, who was also listed in here. Um, so there's, uh, you can see how, uh, you know, there's a, so you can see uh, items coming in, top, uh, top regions in the last 30 days, which might be of interest to some of you as well. And now if we go into collection page, I wanna share some of the features for filtering that are built already built in. These are on, oops, 
I lost my tab. Oh, there it is. So on the now, uh, there is a search function. So let's say COVID. So you'll see uh, 3,000 results. And then um, you can see a further breakdown down here by date and year. Uh, and there's also uh, collections that it's associated with. Um, right here, there's actually a, a couple of registries. So if we wanted to go into the char character lab registry, you'll be able to see those items. And also I wanted to note that there was, uh, you could also actually see some creators if this was something that you wanted to do. So I go back. And uh, on the top right, you also see some options for sharing in social media, favoriting this in your archive.org account if you have one. And this play feature is actually mainly for, um, it'll run through individual items like a slideshow, which is usually for visual artifacts. Um, but yeah, this is like a very cursory overview. We do welcome you to go in and explore. And also we would be interested in any feedback people have on how it's appearing in the archive. Um, we also have a metadata poll that we'd like to share with everyone. Give everyone 20 seconds. And we'll open to discussion later on if others there's we just kind of chose a few because zoom limited us but um, we're definitely eager to hear more. All right, so it looks like uh, most people were interested in subjects and doi but um, looking forward to hearing more takes as we go along. And one other thing we wanted to note is that the Internet Archive also has an advanced search uh, features, which allows you to be able to, um, there's some fields already here, but also some custom fields for you to be able to filter and search. And there's also date and date ranges. One thing that's really nice as well is that you can export um, in JSON, or CSV, and a, a bunch of different formats, something that we also encourage uh, people to use as a tool as they're looking for all sorts of things inside the archive, including the cost registrations. So to go into the next slide, uh, we also wanted to just talk really briefly about the other sort of uh, research-based work that we're doing. Preservation, harnessing the rich research potential of the web is something IA has been involved on in many fronts. One of the exciting new additions for us is Internet Archive Scholar, which is actually spearheaded by our very own Brian Newbold in this uh, call. Through IA Scholar, users can search over 25 million research papers and other scholarly documents preserved in the Internet Archive. Um, we also welcome Welcome you to go in there and look around. It's um, exciting stuff. And then going, oops, it was a little bit too. There we go. Sorry. Uh, it's uh, delayed on my screen. So Internet Archive also supports those engaging in web archival research for social science and humanities research, um, particularly like uh, humanities researchers, local and national libraries, academic institutions, and cultural organizations. These services harness Internet Archive's computing infrastructure to build custom data sets for partnering scholars, researchers, and policymakers. One project uh, to highlight is our partnership with the University of Minnesota and Duke University. This project examined the health of local news media by capturing local news sites and using the Watt data format for early analysis. You can review, you can also review the data in their public collection, just as an example of some researchers who have shared directly in um, the archive. And then Lastly, uh, we wanted to share about documentation. Documentation is uh, a place where you'll be able to learn a lot more about the work that uh, we've done on this project. Just to give you a, uh, a bird's eye view, um, this is also uh, 
appropriately uh, housed inside of an OSF project. Um, within here, you'll be able to see more information on the history of the project, about open science framework, uh, internet archive, uh, registrations, and what's available in them is broken down very clearly. Um, and you'll, be also, you'll also be able to um, look through uh, a couple of different options there as well. Uh, one thing we did want to share specifically is that at the end of this documentation, there is a, a how-to section. This is a, a place for folks to be able to explore about how, um, you know, how they could use some of the um, items that they find in their collections for uh, bulk export, bulk exploration. Sorry, it's taking a little bit of time to load and there's a little bit of delay. So I uh, appreciate folks' as patience as I try to navigate down. Okay, we're getting, we're getting there. So um, amongst these sort of um, options, you'll see that there are uh, sort of recipes or suggestions on how best to filter content, um, how to uh, work with uh, com uh, command line, which is uh, something that we use for a lot of the Internet Archive. There are also places where you can um, look into uh, searching for specific areas in bulk. And uh, these are generally suggestions, provide a general guide when using. Um, we would ask everyone to feel free to look through, substitute on the and focus on areas that are of particular interest to you and your organization. And um, we're going to be sharing these links and this documentation uh, with everyone following this webinar. So with that, we wanted to get a, give a chance for folks to ask any questions they might have. We've kind of given you a large overview of things, but we're ready to learn more from you and to drill in on um, anything that you wanted to learn more about. Everybody on our panel, including the engineers who are working on this project are available for that as well. Are there any questions? And feel free to raise your hand. We also have some questions for you too, so <laughs> we can share that as well. Okay, well, maybe we'll start with some questions. Um, we're very curious about um, how this work are these registrations both on the OSF side and also on the Internet Archive side might uh, be of interest to you and your institution what brings you here and is there uh, anything in particular that um, drew you to this webinar. And please feel free to use the chat. That's oh, a quiet group. It's a bit early. Um, I also had actually I had a question for Brian. Brian, um, I felt like I uh, wanted to do the documentation justice, uh, especially the how to section. Um, you had a couple of great examples in there. Do you have any advice for folks who wanted to, especially those who are not as familiar with you know, uh, some of, you know, command line or some of the uh, things that you have in there to get started? Yeah, mostly, I mean, we have a couple um, examples in there using like kind of Unix style command line tools, which is not, maybe not a, a set of tools that everyone's uh, most familiar or comfortable with, but it can be powerful for working with um, large kind of like superhuman numbers of individual items. Uh, I guess my usual advice with this kind of content is to first just get uh, a little intimate with it. So like try to find some specific individual examples you're, you're curious about and you can um, browse through on the cost side and find the, the corresponding item on the archive.org side and download them and extract them, which you can do. Um, they're just uh, zip files and things like that. So you can open things up um, with your regular desktop um, operating system and, and poke around with it before trying to jump in and, and doing automation. Um, and then we always have, I mean, either any of us individually uh, in this kind of webinar or in the context of this project, but also the archive 
um, generally has support and contact for trying to adapt to specific tools um, or workflows or things like that. Um, so there's there's a number of options uh, for transferring and analyzing content. Great, thank you so much. That's super helpful. Any um, other thoughts from, if anybody is uh, interested or open to sharing more? Oh, Mark, you had a question. I do. So this project has been going on for two years. And as we all know, things kind of, uh, timelines have changed and evolved. And a lot of, there's a lot of progress within two years. So kind of rolling that back, this is a question for Johnny and I think also Brian. What sparked this project? What, what motivated for, what got those gears going in that ball rolling? I can go, I can, I can try to bite it off first. Um, uh, my memory of discussing like kind of the, the early days of this project were around um, uh, kind of twofold. Um, from the archive side, we're interested in trying to get more different types of content. And in particular, uh, as an organization, we often focus on this kind of infrastructure of um, uh, collecting content and preserving in the long run. That's really what we kind of like optimize for is keeping our costs down. We own and operate all of our own infrastructure. Um, and we have a lot of focus on just kind of this like nuts and bolts engineering side of storing content. Um, and we recognize that we're not, we haven't always been the strongest on partnering with people and getting content into uh, the archive and making it more accessible. So for us, this is like very exciting to work directly with external organizations with content. So that's a little bit of the motivation from the archive side. I think from the cost side from my early um, discussions was around uh, sustainability over time, in particular, the cost of cloud storage and bandwidth in particular. Um, so I, I don't want to go into too many of the details, but I think the cost mostly works on a model where you pay when, when content is uploaded, it's stored on cloud storage services. And when people download it, uh, it's downloaded using cloud egress bandwidth. And both of those cost money on a monthly basis. And if you try to project forward over the next 10 years or 50 years, like the cost of that can will just grow over time as there's more and more content um, and more and more, potentially more and more download. So the, the cost can doesn't look great. It becomes difficult to um, keep up with all that. And we at the archive somewhat uniquely have a model where we try to, we focus around trying to fundraise and have a sustainability plan so we can kind of estimate costs upfront. So we can take content in and compute our like, what will this cost to provide access to for the next hundred years? And so it just seemed like kind of a natural um, partnership between the two organizations that we can try to take some of the um, the long-term costs, like the, the kind of like projected costs over the next hundred years of storing and providing access to content in a way that we can kind of do the, the budgeting upfront today, as opposed to trying to project it all the way forward. Um, anyways, maybe I'm rambling here a little bit, but it just seemed like a somewhat natural um, partnership between the two organizations. And then I would also say, like to foreshadow a little bit, like we've started with registrations because they're maybe the most immutable of this kind of content. Like the entire point is to make something of a commitment. It is possible to do embargoes. It is possible to make changes and it's possible to yank things down if there's like a, a, a problem that's encountered along the way. But in general, the, the, the norm would be that these aren't getting updated, you know, every month or there's not a, a continuous new provision. So there's not as much of a need to continuously synchronize between the two systems. Um, but we're certainly interested going forward to accept other content, um, like entire projects or preprints or data sets and things like that. So that's like a little bit of a future looking statement. So I don't know, don't, um, don't hold me completely accountable to that, but uh, it seemed like a good place to start uh, with this kind of content. Yeah, and just to kind of follow that up from the OSF side, we have a lot of storage providers and a lot of people who handle storage and things, but what makes IA different is that they're ideologically aligned for making open access and making things totally public and entirely free for, for archival purposes. So they really fit perfectly into the work and into the research lifecycle for us. And 
uh, kind of fit perfectly into that kind of archival final step in that life cycle where it's uh, going to be uh, out there forever. So uh, it was kind of uh, something that we do a lot, which is deal with storage backends, but something that we have a little special interest in just because of our missions being so aligned and fitting into that part of the, the work cycle. So it was a little bit of what we typically do and a little extra uh, stuff on there. So um, I feel like we always were looking for something to do right as soon as we were formed as an organization uh, in terms of doing something with IA and it's taken us to this time to kind of cement this relationship to the point where we have a real project that we can kind of, uh, you know, uh, expand and uh, reap the rewards of. So many people have seen stuff on IA already, uh, according to the metrics, and, uh, you know, we have thousands of registrations, so it's good to see it finally come to fruition. Thank you. I think this was a monumental step towards the transparency and preservation of, of, of research and being able to spearhead that and um, making sure that research not only continues, but grows exponentially. I think this is a great step towards that, as we all saw with COVID and the need to just having that open science, that open research readily available. So thank you both. All right, thank you so much, everyone. If there are no other questions, I think we all uh, give everyone back 14 minutes in their hours. Um, uh, if we will share documentation and slides with everyone. Additionally, uh, Mark graciously, graciously offered to uh, answer any further questions you might have or information you'd like to have about this project. I'm going to drop Mark's um, email in this chat, but also we'll send it through with the email at the follow-up as well. But Mark is available at uh, directly at mark at cos.io. I appreciate everyone for taking time with us this morning and um, please do explore the registrations and please do share if you have any feedback with us. And one last thing, if you ever do want to revisit this video, we will be hosting this on, on YouTube. So that will also be included in the email as well. Thank you so much, Mark.